At this time, uh, we're going to have our first speaker uh, of the morning, uh, Dr. Uh, Joseph Barney. Dr. Barney is a pulmonologist at UAB. Dr. Barney was with us last year, asked him uh, to return. And so uh, he's no stranger uh, to us. And he's also uh, the medical director at uh, Jefferson State Community College. We started a new program out there about four, about five years ago. And, uh, but Dr. Barney is also the medical director. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Joseph Barney. Good morning. It's good to be with you guys again, um, and also it's nice to be not wearing a mask. Um, I see that you guys are all more than six feet away from me, so you're not going to get anything I have can be contagious. Um, and it's good to go first because you don't know if this is mediocre compared to who's coming up after. So um, they asked me to do this talk about mechanical ventilation in patients with COVID-19, and that's really like 19 talks. So um, to, to summarize this, we're going to kind of go through what's really evolved and changed over the last um, two to three years of all of our lives. Um, and so what I'd like to do today with you is just to kind of discuss the impacts of COVID-19 on sort of ICU care in general, review some of the changes in sedation in the ICU, and this has dramatically changed since COVID happened, explore the uses of non-invasive mechanical ventilation in COVID-19, and really kind of look at some trends in mechanical ventilation in COVID, and uh, kind of briefly touch about you know, modes of mechanical ventilation and where we go from here. Most, many of you actually take care of post-COVID patients and COVID patients with, with us you know, in UAB and you probably have some of you work at other places where you work with teams of people that um, struggle all the time to help people survive and then help them recover. Um, in fact, I was just in the special care unit last week and some of you guys were there and um, we've had tremendous numbers of people come through that unit with tracheostomies and, continual needs for special care to get back to some semblance of life. Um, well, you can't really talk about this without really kind of looking at the impact of SARS-CoV-2. And as of last night, when I was looking over this, um, you can look at the Johns Hopkins tracker, or there's a bunch of trackers, but Johns Hopkins has a really renowned one that looks at cases and deaths. And last night, about nine o'clock, there was 6,320,000 global deaths from COVID. Um, and in the United States, we've had 86.4 million cases and over a million deaths now from COVID in just, in just our country. Um, and if you look at the tracker, um, we're number one for deaths. We're, we're the gold medal of numbers of deaths, um, which is shocking considering our access to advanced medical care. And if you look at all the hospital patients um, you know, that have survived COVID, um, 30% of them or more have long COVID symptoms at, at six months. And this is really, you know, long COVID is not what this talks about, but I think it's really important to realize that the people that we help survive um, being on the Miller with COVID, um, if they do make it all the way home or they make it to some kind of long-term rehab, uh, they're changed forever, most of them are. And many of the people who don't even get admitted to hospital with COVID um, have chronic neuropathy or um, chronic PTSD from, from the disease. And so there's, there's going to be tremendous burden to health care and uh, uh, more, more outpatient visits than we have capacity to take care of. But what we do right now is, you know, kind of we're looking at them in the hospital. Um, and like you, um, last winter, I was thinking that we were about to be done with it. And then um, Omicron happened. And so, you know, basically we've gone through multiple waves of COVID now. Um, people are so tired of COVID, they're making anti-COVID shirts um, and some other things that are now political and politicized about a virus. But, uh, you know, we had this original variant you can see up here on the screen. And then, then you know, as you get these um, mutations that are neutral or negative variants, they kind of die out and then they don't propagate the disease. But these um, advantageous variants lead to an increased transmissibility and then really just more waves of this, um, which many times would have been sort of eliminated or reduced by more vaccine you know, uh, availability and acceptance. By so Delta and Omicron are the last, or the most recent two 
that we have dealt with. Delta was really terrible. Um, and you know, Delta variant created incredible numbers of patients with pneumonitis and ARDS and inpatient, you know, mechanical ventilation and death, chronic kidney failure. Um, and Delta and Omicron both have these very unique mutations um, in places, including the receptor binding region and on the spike protein. Omicron particularly has a bunch of new, new mutations that allow the spike protein, which gets an entry into cells, um, to remain more stable. And so Omicron is um, considered uh, hypertransmissible um, for many reasons. Um, and so we're now kind of dealing with the last phase of what Omicron's been doing. Uh, just to give you perspective, um, I thought that COVID was kind of pretty, pretty much dwindling down to some good reasonable number. Um, and two to three weeks ago, several people that I worked with had to leave work because of becoming infected. And they weren't very sick, but they couldn't come to work, and so that puts more strain on healthcare. And that, that kind of happened to respiratory therapists and nurses. And in fact, if I were to ask you in the room, I would, how many of you have had COVID? Um, a lot of you would probably raise your hands and it, you know, you had to leave work and take time off. Um, I had it in the spring of this year, um, had to quarantine for a few days. Um, and fortunately, was vaccinated by that time. And one major difference that we have seen, and this is not explaining all of it, is that the differences between Omicron and Delta, um, the way that they present and the way that they look to us are substantially different. And part of that is related to where they concentrate in the body. So you can see that um, Omicron on the right tends to cluster and, and replicate in the upper airway of the patients in the back of the throat, in the nose, and in the pharynx. Um, and, and Delta really kind of got way down in the deeper parts of the lungs and caused a lot of alveolar damage and pneumonitis, which we're not seeing a lot of with Omicron. Um, some people still get on the ventilator with it, but when Omicron came around as another wave, it might be because a lot of people who got Omicron had already had Delta, so they had a lot of immunity, and so they had milder disease, or they were vaccinated when they got Omicron, um, and they just stayed home. But the unvaccinated people with Omicron tended to not have as much severe disease, if you look at them as a whole group, as what we saw with Delta. People who had Delta had tremendous uh, amounts of progression to respiratory failure, and um, and ventilation and prolonged ventilation and prone ventilation and lots of respiratory therapists and nurses taking care of them. And a lot of people with Omicron are either staying home or if they get admitted to the hospital, they're, they're staying on the floors. And you really can't look at mortality on this without kind of discussing vaccination status. Um, this is uh, from General Cardiology or Cardiac Failure. And this is a cohort of patients that they followed by vaccine status who all had heart failure um, and, and some other comorbidities, but they were mainly followed for their congestive heart failure status. And you can see that they start at time zero and go all the way to, to the far right where the curves all go up and stop, and that's 365 days to the year. And it stops because that's just when they stop tracking information. And you can see in the red uh, image, this is what unvaccinated patients look like by mortality, meaning dying. Um, and blue or this turquoise is partially vaccinated and um, dark green is fully vaccinated and then there's purple blue which is vaccinated and boosted and the fully vaccinated and boosted people really look the same they have the same survival and mortality curve at the very bottom of this and the partially vaccinated is is somewhere in between and the unvaccinated people really tick up you know at about 250 to 350 days you start seeing a lot of them dying from covid because they're unvaccinated compared to their cohorts and this, uh, peers in this cohort. And we know also that COVID-19 vaccines protect cancer patients. This is um, from Lancet Oncology, um, from uh, a large kind of multi-hospital system cohort of patients in different countries in Europe that were pulled together, um, looking at um, pre-vaccination phase of this, this far left light blue color and patients that existed and were tracked before vaccines were available. Um, and then you can see this al alpha to delta phase unvaccinated is green, and then alpha to delta vaccinated is lighter green. And, and pretty much in the 28-day fatality rate, the 14-day fatality rate, and pretty much everything across the board except hospitalization vaccination protected them more. It didn't do a lot to prevent them from getting hospitalized, but if they did get hospitalized, they tended more to make it out the door home. And so uh, we know in that cohort of patients, vaccination has had tremendous impacts on uh, preventing death and preventing mortality. 
And um, if you look at COVID-19 and mortality among patients on a ventilator, um, the older you are, the worse it is. And so this, this cohort here on the far left, on your far left, is uh, patients 0 to 40, and then it goes up by decades, 40 to 50, which will be where I'm at right now, 51 to 60, 60 to 70, 70 to 80, 80 and above. And if you are relatively young, which I guess I'm not anymore because I'm not in that category, um, if um, you, are, you would have a much likelier chance of being alive uh, after being on mechanical ventilation than if you were at greater than 80. Um, and so um, the older you are in general, the worse it is for you. Uh, greater than 80 year olds made up a huge amount of mortality with COVID when it first happened in Europe and Italy in New York City, uh, where they had tremendous amounts of patients dying and a lot of them were um, geriatric patients that um, had a lot of comorbidities and they just couldn't survive. And this is a really busy slide and I don't need you to take anything away from it except the shape of the curves um, and it's relatively blurry, but they, this is looking at adjusted rate ratios uh, for underlying medical conditions. And if you look at one, two, three, four over this column here, this is ventilation or ECMO. So they kind of grouped people together who needed to be in, intubated and ventilated or put on ECMO as kind of one cohort or one, one outcome. And they looked at ages kind of going down from top to bottom. You know, 18 to 49, 30 to 44, 65 to 74, and 30 to 75. And, and the curves for this, ventilation or ECMO, kind of look shaped like this. And they kind of do that for all of these comorbidities. But what you'll notice is that as you're younger, if you're 18 to 49, um, if you have asthma, it puts you at much more, slightly more or moderately more risk of needing ventilation or ECMO if you've got COVID. And your smoking status didn't really make much difference. And that's because you probably haven't been smoking that long. Even if you smoke really heavily and you're 18 years old, you probably haven't acquired as much lung disease. And if you go down to the much older cohort, 75 or more, um, asthma doesn't play as much of a role in this curve, but smoking certainly does. And then all these comorbidities in the middle, which would be you know, COPD, chronic kidney disease, chronic liver disease, they all push this out to the right. So if you have any of these comorbidities, um, you're much more likely to need ventilation and ECMO if you get COVID than if you're relatively healthy for your age group. And you're not probably going to be surprised by this, but COVID-19 care in the ICU is really expensive. Um, care in the ICU in general is expensive, but people who get COVID-19 and go to the ICU, a lot of them um, have a really long, long stay. <laughs> Some patients have been on mechanical ventilation for 60 days in an ICU or longer. Uh, and this is sort of just a, a sort of a spitball idea, but this is a cohort of um, people from advanced, like looked at by Osfeld and some others in a large sort of database in the United States. And this is median total cost um, overall for COVID-19 patients. You can see on the left that it's 11,267 in the hospital. And then if you're in the ICU, um, it's more. And then you can see kind of the distribution of where this costs the most and the least. Uh, in the South, it's much less expensive than if you're a patient in the Northeast. It's about the same in the Midwest as us, and um, community hospitals um, tend to be cheaper than if you're at an academic center. And that's probably got a lot of variables for that. One reason would be that if you're at a, at a community practice hospital and you have really advanced mechanical ventilation needs, you might not stay there if there's a place that you could be transferred to. So that bill gets stopped the day you transfer to another hospital system and a new bill starts. Um, and um, the mortality may be different than one of those places versus another and a lot of other things that are affected by it. But it's expensive nonetheless. Um, being in an ICU and on invasive mechanical ventilation is much more expensive than, than any of the other scenarios you could have. And so this looks at um, hospital length of stay days and hospital mortalities and hospital charges. So hospital charges is gonna be what the hospital charges the hospital patient's insurance and hospital costs is what the hospital system itself accrued providing the care. And you could look at median or mean and we'll just look at mean. If you're without an ICU or without and without invasive mechanical ventilation, mean costs or charges to your insurance about $50,000 for a COVID-19 stay. If you're with, with an ICU, meaning you're admitted to the unit, but you don't ever get intubated, um, 95546 bucks. 
uh, without an IC, but with invasive mechanical ventilation, which I couldn't find in, their, in this paper what that means, where they provided that to them. I guess in the hallway, uh, it's more. Um, and if you're in an ICU and on invasive mechanical ventilation, you know, your median, your mean costs 301,000 bucks. So um, as you get in a unit and if you get on invasive mechanical ventilation, your length of stay is going to be longer and the cost to take care of you per day and the cost to your insurance and or you is going to be more. An ECMO um, saves people's lives um, and it uh, has been a revolutionary therapy that really came along, uh, it's been around for a while, it really made its debut or prevalence in adult patients with respiratory failure during H1N1. There was a huge uptake in ECMO use back in 2009-2010 when we had an H1N1 surge, which I was here for, and some of you probably were, have taken care of that, that one year of badness. Um, and we know ECMO is expensive, but we don't have good figures. Um, the, the charges for this are a little hard to track down. This is one multi, multi sort of uh, analysis looking at it, and these are different uh, ECMO centers and their cost. This is a guy named Kawashima who did extra portal membrane CPR in Japan, and they converted the cost of this from Japanese yen to dollars. And then there was a study from China with this guy named Singh, and they converted this to dollars, so they made everything dollars. And then they looked at what it cost um, in general for ECMO care. And you can see at the bottom, mainly, that if you look at respiratory, 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 these are patients that were put on ECMO for hypoxic respiratory failure for reasons like COVID-19 or H1N1 influenza. And all the stuff above would be post-surgical ECMO or eCPR or cardiogenic shock for people with that heart disease that are slightly different reasons to be on, you know, extracorporeal membrane ventilation or circulation. And you can see at the bottom, if you look at respiratory down, um, the cost of ECMO is about 54, anywhere from $54,000 to $193,000. That's for the ECMO, and that doesn't include the cost of them being in the hospital, or getting the nursing care, or any of that. So, um, any of these advanced modalities of treatment, which save people's lives, come with cost, and the longer you're on one of them, the more cost, and so we have to remember that. And um, in a way of being not political, the cost of three vaccines um, is infinitesimally smaller than the cost of an ECMO run on a patient. So bear that in mind. Uh, my vaccines were free, but I mean, there's no free lunch. Somebody paid for them. Um, COVID-19 changed how we did sedation in the ICU forever. No, no question about it. If I can tell you one thing that we changed, that it changed, it was how much sedation we used, the combinations of sedation we used, the amount of post-sedation um, recovery time it takes for patients, how much PTSD they have after being on sedation. It, it's phenomenally different. And we saw the beginnings of this in H1N1 10 years ago when we started seeing that they had huge requirements for, say, fentanyl or other narcotic analgesics while on ventilation. And COVID-19 said, hold my coat, let me show you how that's done. And it has been an incredibly um, practice change. Um, before COVID, in the ICU, we, in a medical ICU, uh, we generally try to use lighter sedation preferences on patients with invasive mechanical ventilation. And we really did not like valeriogenic medications. We, there was a, a Bible of literature that came out that said Versed and benzodiazepines are bad medicine and it causes delirium in older patients. And it did. Um, and we tried to avoid paralytics and we did daily awakenings way very early to try and you know, do spontaneous awakening trials on patients. And after COVID, um, we have been using much more layered and heavier sedation combinations in patients. And we discovered that benzodiazepines aren't so bad um, because there's, sometimes there are patients who have to have them in combination to just be able to ventilate. And, and this is how, how it is now. Paralytics are more often used, although not as first choice, obviously. And then we don't do daily awakenings the day after we intubate somebody with COVID if they're really you know, hard to ventilate. And a lot of them, the day after they're intubated, they're laying face down. So there's no point in trying to wake that person up to see how they're going to do on a spontaneous awakening trial because it's going to go bad. So this is the new era. Um, and there's some special issues with sedation in COVID patients on invasive mechanical ventilation. M many people with COVID ARDS on invasive mechanical ventilation are going to be on for a really long time, like 
not, not one week, not two weeks, three weeks to four weeks. Um, and during that time, we'll probably spend a lot of that time prone and later. And during that prone dilation, we'll require a lot of sedation. Um, longer times on continuous sedation, I mean, some patients, and a lot, a lot of patients, will develop tachyphylaxis to narcotics. Um, so, uh, you know, fentanyl is very commonly used. You guys have all seen that. And we have discovered that we have had to switch medications after six to seven days because it's no longer working. And the biology of that patient's you know, receptors to that medication has um, changed. So it's not as effective and they're switched to something else. Um, and that comes around because patients are re requiring sedation at heavier and longer times. Um, and we really, really want to avoid self-extubation when people are prone um, and or you have to get in the room and put on eight layers of PPE before you can even get around to the part of intubating them. The last thing you want is a patient who's on a really high amount of vent support um, to pull their tube out in a room that's behind a glass door where you have to put on a bunch of equipment and get everything pushed in to take care of that and put them back on a vent layer. So we tend to not want self extubations even more than before. And that's one reason why there have been lots of heavier uses of sedation. And H1N1 gave us a preview of this. During the pandemic of 20, 2009 to 2010, they had higher fentanyl requirements compared to non-H1N1 non ARDS patients. Um, and we're seeing similar patterns, longer duration of sedation, more complex combinations of sedation drips, more PTSD in people after they get liberated from mechanical ventilation. Um, this, is, this is kind of the new landscape of COVID. Other sedation we use, propofol, used fairly frequently. This is a GABA receptor agonist that's been around um, in anesthesia um, realms and ICU realms forever. It's a good sedation medication. It's a good anti-medic. It stops seizures in patients. Um, it has good amnestic effects. It has a rapid onset and cessation. You can turn it off and on fast. Um, it can cause hypertension at higher doses. It requires monitoring for hypertrichloride. Um, it is used in many patients with COVID in combination with two to three other things and will be on for quite some time. And we also use now a lot of Presidex. So dexometamidine is an alpha-2 adrenergic agonist with anxiolytic properties, sedation, and neuroprotective effects. It can be continued after you extubate the patient. They can be wide awake and take the medication. Um, it's actually been used a tremendous amount in the era of COVID in patients on non-invasive mechanical ventilation or BiPAP. Um, to help them remain calm while that's on with some success in a few patients. And then we use now a lot of ketamine, um, you know, which is a, you know, an NBA receptor antagonist that was used for you know, conscious sedation by orthopedic doctors and some other you know, specialties for quite some time and, and not used much at all for ICU sedation until COVID came around. Um, it is very useful in reducing opioid dosing and can help with you know, weaning off the ventilator um, and we have run out of it hand over hand. Shortages of this medication have happened probably at least five times in the last couple of years where you're wondering what happens when that bag runs out and the patient's on it and that's the only thing that works for them. So, um, before we get to putting people on ventilator, we really probably should talk about what happens when we put them on BiPAP. And before we talk about that, we ought to realize that um, in a global perspective, um, you know, up to 80% of people who have COVID in the general population will really have this inconsequential flu-like illness or may even be asymptomatic. A lot of people will just come to clinic and get a nose swab and they, you tell them to go home and don't see me or anybody else for 14 days. Tell your family to put pancakes on your bedroom door and watch Netflix, don't come out. Um, and then 20% develop this viral respiratory pneumonia with ARDS and other, other people who develop this, you know, ARDS syndrome uh, about 15% of them will require support with invasive mechanical ventilation. Um, and as many as 75% you know, of patients or higher people with admitted with COVID pneumonia to a unit will require invasive mechanical ventilation. So here's some differences. In the beginning of COVID, right in 2019 when it first came out, um, we were all in the ICUs trying to figure out what to do. There was no vaccine. We didn't have good test for it. They were developing tests. Um, and the risk of droplet spread was unknown. We had no idea. We were all terrified about what to do. How do we go in the room without putting stuff on? Um, early intubation was a fundamental rule. We intubated people in the very beginning of COVID. If they were on more than six liters of nasal cannula oxygen, 
to prevent spread of droplets and to, to protect the patient and us from each other. Um, and we never used non-invasive ventilation at the beginning of it, and we never put people on high flow because we thought that would spread the disease. Um, and in 2020 to 2022, in the not so early COVID era, um, we had more data and we knew that droplet spread with a patient on high flow or BiPAP in a room with a negative pressure device was pretty minimal as long as we're wearing everything ourselves. And we had staff that were vaccinated, which was a game changer. I mean, it did protect everybody, but it protected a lot of us. And I would rather walk into a room with vaccines in me than not if I had a patient with bleeding all over me. And we learned that patients who are on six liters don't need to be intubated. We could just watch them and turn it up a little bit. So we started using much, much more high flow and some BiPAP in these patients, and we still do that now. And one of the things that drove this in some places, in addition to being able to be safer, is that we ran out of ventilators in the beginning. We just ran out of ventilators in places. In New York City, they had five people sometimes on one ventilator connected with a circuit, and they were running out of machines, and they said, well, there's a bypass machine, so we can either put that person on it or watch them perish, and they did. So this is the now, and that was the then. And there's problems with non-invasive ventilation in these patients. So if you look at, this is from Critical Care 2021 from the REVA network, um, numbers of days along the bottom, and cumulative events and probability of surviving on the right. So this is the survival curve over here. And these are COVID-19 patients admitted to um, ICUs. This is a sort of multi, multi-center collection. You can see that um, non-invasive ventilation has a really high mortality rate for them uh, compared to standard oxygen or high flow, which are about the same. Um, and so there's some differences in this. Um, Non-invasive ventilation shows higher mortality in COVID at ARDS patients and doesn't reduce progression to intubation in many studies. And we can't, one of the reasons for this is you can't control tidal volume, and many patients can get as much as 9 to 10 milliliters per kilo of that while they're breathing really fast on a BiPAP machine and freaking out sometimes. Um, but it can be useful in COVID patients who have ARDS who are DNIs. So this is kind of where it's sort of falling out. Um, and a lot of times we'll have patients who are on BiPAP or non-invasive ventilation and on a, a sedation medicine like Presidex to try and allow that to stave off. Um, high flow nasal cannula doesn't increase or reduce mortality in patients with COVID ARDS. Um, it has sort of a neutral effect, um, but it doesn't expose patients to higher tidal volumes. And, and what we see here on the left with non-invasive ventilation has now been called biotrauma, where the patient themselves breathes heavily and pulls in much higher tidal volume than it uses and more lung injury to themselves while on my cap. Um, sort of like myotrauma, except the patient costs. Um, a lot of times high flow nasal cannula is more comfortable, um, and it also can be useful in COVID ARDS patients who are DNI um, that we get as an, in an ICU while they're deciding on their goals of care. And here's more bad news for non-invasive ventilation. So this is um, from Garcia and Critical Care of 2021. You can see that um, this is another survival curve, and if you look at the purple at the very bottom, this is not invasive or BiPAP. Um, in, invasive mechanical ventilations in the blue, and um, high flow nasal cannula and just supplemental oxygen kind of along the top. And it's not surprising that if you stay on supplemental oxygen the whole time, your mortality is not that bad. That kind of makes sense. But the differences between um, non-invasive ventilation and invasive, invasive mechanical ventilation are substantial. You can see that patients who um, go along the uh, time since ICU admission on the bottom right, as you're on BiPAP longer, you're more likely to die compared to just being on the bed. Um, so, successful invasive mechanical ventilation in patients with COVID involves a couple of key fundamental parts. Prone ventilation is here to stay and will not go away. And it's been shown to improve oxygenation in most all forms of arts. Um, in the 1970s, it was discovered that we had improved gas exchange in patients by some people um, working with patients on ventilators. And since then, it has really kind of um, become the numb to get, the practice you know, of the day. Uh, it's most beneficial when deployed early in the case, in the course of invasive mechanical ventilation. So if you wait till somebody's been on BiPAP for six days and then decide you know, to intubate them, they probably had biotrauma or some other complications. Um, and it's indicated for moderate to severe ARDS with, you know, patients with PF ratios less than 150. And we have a standard schedule that's been, you know, examined with multiple studies. Um, some people are looking at longer runs, but generally the standard is 18 hours prone and six, six hours supine. And um, 
almost all of you who are working right now as therapists have probably participated in flipping patients over um, with groups of people um, at certain times and trying to get all that coordinated. Um, it was deployed really successfully in H1N1 between 2009 and 2010. Um, you know, and also in addition to prone ventilation, we, we tend to have a standard low tidal volume ventilation strategy and good sedation. And this is what the mechanics of it looks like in a, in a pretty good diagram from Scientific American. You can see on, on the left, this is a patient um, breathing supine. The, the blue is their spine at the bottom. The red is their heart. And the, the white circles are ventilated areas of lung. And gray, green, and black bars are all areas that are not um, recruited or ventilated. And then if you flip the patient over, the top is end inspiration and the bottom is end expiration. You can see that when you put them prone um, on the top right diagram, their, their spine's at the top, their heart's in the middle, that you get um, much more recruitment here. And then you still do have the recruitment at end expiration, but the, the gas exchange is better for many reasons. Um, this is a, a really interesting piece of inter information or sort of research from PARP and some others in re respiratory research that looks at their PDF ratio on the, on the Y axis. And this looks at COVID-19 patients versus non-COVID-19 uh, patients, um, looking at um, PDF ratio changes with um, proning. And you can see, sorry, um, that in COVID-19 patients, um, baseline is the black bar. And then the two bars that follow that um, to the right of that are proning one, proning two, and then supine again. And you can see that the PDF ratios in COVID-19 go up pretty robustly as they're prone and then prone again, and then as you put them supine, they come back down to some higher level than baseline. Uh, and the, the response in this, um, in non-COVID um, PDF matched and non-COVID entire group patients, so these people in these two groups here are large patients without COVID, have a similar trend, but COVID has a, a much more robust response to it. And then you can see prone ventilation looking at um, static compliance on the ventilator, and um, again, the beginning of this, here is um, baseline, and then they prone them, and then they prone them again, and then they bring them back to supine. And then COVID-19 patients, as you prone them, you bring their compliance up, and you prone them again, and you bring their compliance up more, and then you put them back, and they haven't been recruited yet from this. And this is actually even more robust than non-COVID arch patients. Um, and this um, is, a, is a lab kind of based study that looked at what prone ventilation does to lung inflammation. So they took um, several of these Wistar rats, um, this cute little fellow right here is um, destined to be a, a histology slide at some point, but he's gonna live his life with his cohorts for a while. And what they did was they took um, control here on the far left, um, and this is um, chrome and supine. And so they um, injected uh, several of these rats with lipopolysaccharide and peritoneum. And what that does is it's a model for sepsis and septic shock that creates ARDS. So um, when they did, did this, the control group, um, the LPS supine actually is in the middle, they looked at how much lung inflammation uh, was present. And um, in the supine group, they had even more inflammation um, than um, the uh, people, the rats that were prone. So early prone ventilation in, in patients and in animal models that looks at direct inflammation in the lung with like neutrophil infiltration of, of lung tissue reduces this and improves outcomes in this way as well. And that's a whole section of biology that we can kind of talk about. And we also discovered, and this is um, some emerging kind of model data out of um, the UK and some places in Europe that started describing two different phenotypes of ARDS, um, this L and H phenotype. And, and they, they looked at different physiologic radiographic um, lab parameters and they describe these two different kind of subtypes. The, the L, this um, L subtype of COVID-19 ARDS has this regulated pulmonary perfusion and some vascular abnormalities. And the main thing that it sort of differentiates it is it has a lot of peripheral ground glass on imaging um, and it has low recruitability and low elastance. So these patients, um, while they have a better looking image on this scan, on these regular CTs, they're actually harder to ventilate than these patients with L, or the, sorry, with H phenotype. And this H phenotype um, has a lot more edema, and you can tell this is a, a British study because of how they spell it, um, and more recruitability and more elastance. Um, and this H phenotype behaves much more like 
H1N1 or any other form of ARDS that we've encountered. This sort of behaved like regular ARDS and this is more difficult. Um, and so um, they allow, uh, if you have a, an L phenotype, lower levels of heat and more liberal ventilation uh, levels with like higher tidal volumes. Whereas this H phenotype, think of it as just, we're gonna still do low tidal volume ventilation. Um, and people say, okay, there's a mode of ventilation that's better for this. Well, there, there's probably not. Every patient's a little different. There's really not a mode of ventilation as far as volume control versus pressure control that's been superior in COVID ARDS as a large group. It really just depends on what the patient's more comfortable with. Um, some patients are more comfortable on pressure control for sure. The majority of patients can be successfully ventilated on volume control and dynamic changes in lung compliance that happen on pressure control ventilation are things that we worry about if they become much more compliant and we're putting too much about tidal volume. And under sedated patients are going to be uncomfortable on any mode of modality. So the worst possible outcome um, is to have a patient not getting enough sedation and changing both ventilator modes around to get them more comfortable when they just when they need more fentanyl to begin with, and then figuring out the vent afterwards. So where do we go from here? Um, hopefully a society with more vaccinated people so we don't all have to keep coming in and taking care of more ventilated patients. Um, in an apolitical way, vaccines help and they're, they're the most cost effective and mortality effective therapy that we have. They, they cost nothing compared to a $54,000 hospital stay. Um, COVID ARDS is a model for more viral epidemics that may come and probably will come. Uh, hopefully not in your lifetime, but it's likely. And what we really need are well done ventilation protocols, you know, adequate higher amounts of sedation, um, low tidal volume ventilation, prone ventilation, and, and timely uh, use of that, and getting good housekeeping. You know, so what keeps people alive when they're on a ventilator for three weeks um, is good DVT prophylaxis, good skin care, good early physical therapy, a nurse who cleans their mouth out to keep them from getting ventilator pneumonia, a therapist who gets their you know, medications to them on time, that kind of stuff. That's what keeps them alive until they get better. Because once they get lung injury, we're just keeping them alive until it gets better. That's kind of what we're doing. Now, there's no magic to it. Yeah. So here's some questions, and I'm going to let you ask me. I get asked this a few times, and I've asked it myself. If a patient has been prone for a long time and recovered, and then gets hypoxic again, should we reprone them? Depends. Um, many will have no benefit at this point, and their gas exchange improvement after a few hours of reproning will tell you this. We have reprone people at UAB multiple, multiple times. If you reprone them and they have an improvement in gas exchange in four hours, sure, keep doing it. And if they don't have any improvement, stop doing it, probably because it's futile at this point. And if they don't respond, um, you know, resources are scarce. It takes a lot of people to flip a patient over. So if it's not working, um, doing the same thing over and over again is um, not good. Does awake proning work? Yes, but it depends. So let me give you some examples because awake proning came around recently and it was um, the best thing since sliced bread, but it really is just sort of dependent on the patient. Um, let me give an example. 68 year old lady with COVID and hypoxia, high flow nasal cannula. Uh, 90%, 80 liters. Um, advanced dementia and delirium. Like she's very confused. Don't put that lady face down because it's not going to go well. Um, she's probably going to get more delirious and more confused and more combative, and it's not going to end up well for anybody. Next scenario 57 year old guy with COVID and hypoxia on high flow nasal cannula, same settings. He knows where he's at, and he's texting his wife. Sure, put him face down, see what happens. He can just roll himself back over for you if he wants. Um, he's probably not going to have any downside to that, and he may improve, and it may prevent him from being intimate. Last scenario, which um, happens more often than not, and residents will come and want to put this person face down. 48-year-old guy with COVID, severe hypoxia on bipap, on 100%, breathing 36 to 40 times a minute. Please don't put that guy face down. Is he's just going to end up intubated. That person probably should be intubated um, because it's coming and it's going to happen and you don't want to do it with them having to be flipped over. So awake proning is great in the right scenario. Um, and so that's kind of my take. Um, when should we treat patients with COVID? When it's safe. Um, usually much later than in other forms of ARDS. Um, you can't prone people with a trait really well. And so a lot of people will be prone for three weeks and we have to wait till after. Benefits from tracheostomy, reduced sedation requirements, better oral care, less ventilator-associated pneumonia, less delirium. 
uh, improved ability to communicate with their families, and improved ability to start participating in physical therapy. It, it, they help, but you have to make sure it's the right time to do it. Your questions? Tomatoes, cabbage, anything you want to throw? <laughs> I'd probably eat it right now because of much food cost. You have a question? Uh, I was reading, you said that on an occasion they should be on eight, um, on their belly for 18 hours. Yeah, that's what and they do. Six hours. Flipped over, yeah. And if they don't tolerate it, they'll, they'll go earlier, but they typically do an 18 hour schedule with six to five. And they have looked at um, and are looking at you know, finding the data on what happens when you do 24 hours face down, um, which has complications. I mean, you know, facial decubiti, breakdown of the skin on the face, you know, were reported way earlier in Europe when they started doing a lot of prone ventilation. And you, you just have to like do a lot of swimming, repositioning the patient. But it's 18 on, face down, and six hours on the back. Uh, and they'll do that for three weeks sometimes. And some people walk out eventually and some don't. A lot of them would not if they didn't do it. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Well, I hope you guys have a great rest of the day and um, that you don't come in contact with anybody that's got COVID. I thank you for your time. <laughs> I'm going to unplug this. Is that okay? Oops.